Today's scripture comes from Mark 4, verses 30 to 32. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out larger branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. You may be seated. As you're seated, let me pray for us. Father, we're grateful for the parables of Jesus that we've been able to look at from you know, the last number of weeks until today. We're grateful for this parable of the kingdom, and we ask you that you would help us to comprehend the fullness of your love to us in Christ as we do look at this passage, and that we would not just have it hit our minds for understanding, but our hearts for believing that it would translate into the way that we live our lives and the work of our hands. Lord, that we would be faithful to you, that you'd be glorified through the way this church lives every single day, and we ask you all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we are dropping into Mark chapter 4, the parable of the mustard seed. And I want to just shed a little bit of light just in terms of where Mark's gospel begins and how we get into this chapter. We see already in the gospel of Mark, before we get to this parable of the mustard seed, we see already that Jesus has begun to preach and teach about the kingdom of God. We're going to look at that in a few moments. We see Jesus calling his first disciples to come and follow him. We see Jesus casting out demons and healing the sick. We see Jesus drawing a crowd. And we see him being challenged by the religious leaders who are concerned with all of the things that he is doing. Jesus has come out of almost total obscurity and he is disrupting the religious status quo and doing and saying things that the religious leaders think he should not be doing or saying. His kingdom is subversive. The kingdom of Jesus is subversive. It's not sneaky or manipulative. He's not turning the world upside down. Uh, His kingdom message is subversive in the way where he has come to set the world right. And that's what we find in the Gospel of Mark. And this is what makes the followers of Jesus so attracted to him, and it is what so deeply concerns all of the religious leaders who are observing him. If what Jesus is preaching and teaching, this is their concern, if what he is doing and what he is calling others to do, if that all of a sudden takes roots in their heart, if it takes root in their being, what will happen is a subversion of the existing kingdom visions and a subversion of the power structures of Israel that the religious leaders are very uh, favorable toward. They're concerned with this teaching of Jesus. Now imagine walking with Jesus as one of his disciples at this point in his journey. As you come up to Mark chapter 4, he's begun teaching. There's been signs, wonders, miracles. He's talking about the kingdom. He's challenging all sorts of different things that are held by people that are not biblical, but they're held based in the structures and values of their day. He's challenging them, and then he starts to teach in parables. What he's been doing so far is he's just this, he's an almost unknown rabbi from a, a little obscure town that people make fun of. And he's traveling in these dusty trails from town to town, and then he eventually goes to Jerusalem, and he's preaching and teaching in Jerusalem, and he's preaching and teaching in the temple, and then he goes and he's preaching and teaching in the countryside, and here now he's teaching by the sea. He's all over the place. He's he's traveling around. Imagine following him at this point. People are hearing and they're responding to his message. They're seeing his miracles. They're being drawn to him. But but what the crowd see, and I want us to, 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 to square this away in our thinking and to get this in our minds as we look at the rest of this passage and, and, and through this time. What they're seeing, what the religious leaders are afraid of, is the potential of what he's preaching. There's something in seed form in the way that Jesus is preaching and teaching, the way he's slowly revealing who he is. There's something in seed form that is going to take root in the hearts of many. But what challenges some and what causes others concern is the potential of the kingdom message that he is preaching. What he is preaching is filling people with hope. There was an expectation when they were in the presence of Jesus. And just like a seed that is being planted with the hope and the expectation of what it's going to grow into, Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God was all about the potential of what was to come. We're going to look at this three points today. We're going to talk about the seed the kingdom, and the cross. The seed, the kingdom, and the cross. Look at the text again. We're going to look at the seed here. Let's look at the text again. Mark chapter 4, verse 30. And he said, what can we 
Uh, With what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. We're talking about the seed. The mustard seed was proverbially small. It was known as the smallest seed. This is what the rabbis and teachers of the day would talk about when they talked about the smallest seed. It was proverbial smallness. It was small, but it was also known for what it produced, which was the biggest thing that would grow in your garden. Smallest seed, biggest plant in your garden. When I was a kid, we had a massive garden. Uh, I grew up in central Alberta. Most of you know that. We had this massive garden. Our garden was bigger than most city lots in Vancouver. We had a giant garden. And uh, we would plant that garden every spring. And now I'm not saying I was a good laborer. I'm I'm not even saying I was willing. Um, I am saying, though, that I was free. Uh, the the, the, The labor price was right when I got conscripted into garden planting in the spring. Uh, my grandma and my mom and my aunt would have a diagram of the whole garden and they would lay out each row and what was going to be planted in each row. And so this row is all peas, this row is half carrots, this row has some radishes, the potatoes are going to be at that end of the garden. It was all of these kind of things. And they would lay this whole thing out, they would make this whole plan. Take the little packets of seed and we would go along and we would put the seeds in and I would get chastised for putting too many seeds and I'd get chastised for not putting enough seeds and I would get chastised for the rows not being deep enough and i get chastised for the rows being too deep. And that's how my memory of gardening goes. <clears throat> Hence, we go to the grocery store. <laughs> now, months later into the summer and then into the fall, what we would do is those seeds would turn into meals. And those seeds would turn into little freezer bags of just filling up the freezer all kinds of different vegetables that had been vacuum sealed and frozen. What it would turn into in the fall was a root cellar full of vegetables that would last us at least halfway through the winter. It was about the potential of what that garden would yield. And what I know about our garden was nothing in our garden grew as big as a mustard plant. When we planted our garden in the spring, we had this small little box of seeds It was a box. I remember my grandmother had a little wooden box and it had all these packets of seeds in it. That little packet of seeds was a picture of the promise and the possibility of what was to come later that fall. Because she grew up in the Depression, there was always packets of seeds that looked like they'd been there for many years. Like I think the packet of seeds is about a dollar and there would just be a few seeds left in the bottom of it and she'd oh, we don't waste that. We'd keep that packet of seeds and we would go and we'd faithfully plant it, we would water it, we would do all the things that you need to do. See, the kingdom of God here is not being compared to a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is being compared to what happens to a mustard seed. The point here is that the smallest seed they knew about when Jesus was teaching turns into the biggest plant in the garden. Jesus is contrasting the smallness of of the seed with the largeness of the plant that comes from it, but it is not just about the contrast of size, it's about the possibility of what is to come. The smallest seed yields the biggest plant. And same goes for the kingdom of God. What starts out in almost total obscurity in a small town in a forgotten part of the country is growing and spreading. It's been promised from generations past what is to come, but when Jesus comes, things change. It was promised in the book of Isaiah. It was promised in the book of Habakkuk. One day that the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There's something here about the potential that is in seed form when the kingdom comes. Jesus has come to announce that this is happening. So he's saying to his disciples, the kingdom of God rises out of obscurity and seeming insignificance, but one day that kingdom is going to be seen and acknowledged by all. That's what he's saying. Look at the text again, verse 31. The kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Several times in the Old Testament, the prophets spoke of the nations or the Gentiles, that is the non-Jewish people. They talked about them as the birds of the air. So this is an interesting line as well. We're looking at this as an interesting truth being revealed. The large 
branches that are going to come out from this one little mustard seed are going to grow broad enough that birds can come and make a nest under the shade it creates. Jesus is saying not only will the kingdom of God rise out of obscurity and seeming insignificance, but it's also going to become a home for all people to be included as God's people. The people who were not initially God's people can become God's people and come and find a home under the growth of the kingdom. Let me show you one of those examples that we find in the scripture. It says in Ezekiel 17, verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. So you see the connection between Ezekiel and the Gospel of Mark that under the branches will the birds be able to come and nest. The kingdom of God, like we said last week in talking about the parable of the wedding feast, the kingdom of God is inclusive to all kinds of people, that they can come and nest, as it were, under the shade of this beautiful protection and the branches that are there produced. So this is a parable about the kingdom of God. The contrast between a shockingly small beginning and an expansive and inclusive result. But the contrast, again, is not just comparison in size as much about comparative possibilities. It's a parable about kingdom hope and kingdom expectation and kingdom potential, all wrapped up in the life and ministry of Jesus. It is a parable about the kingdom of God. That first is the seed. Second, we need to talk about the kingdom. That's the seed. Let's talk about the kingdom. There's a guy named R.C. Sproul, who was a theologian. He died five or six years ago. And uh, he tells a story of something that happened to him. He was a professor at a university that had all kinds of different programs uh, running. He was a theology professor teaching there. And he's talking about one day he's taking his lunch. He's eating his lunch in the staff lunchroom. And he walks out and he's going to be a little bit, he's like pushing it for time. He's got to get to his class to go and teach his afternoon lecture, you know, deliver his afternoon lecture. And so he's crossing this open courtyard from whatever building he was in to the building that he needed to go to. And he's out there and he's kind of, as you are when you're a little bit late and you're focused on what you're about to go and do, he's focused. He's laser focused in. He's kind of dialed in. He's walking along and he says he's walking, minding his own business. And this young man jumps in front of him and blocks his way and says, are you saved? And he looks at him and goes, save from what? (laughs) Which is a great question. Sometimes we use words. We did a series of messages years and years ago called church words. Sometimes we use words that we don't always define. And when we don't define them, we're, we're kind of hindering ourselves. You've been in a community group before where you're sitting in the discussion and, you know, Sam writes one of the questions. is like, just talk about, like, define the gospel. And you're like... Okay, in the community group, leaders, well, what is the gospel? And you sit there and think, oh, I sure hope someone else answers this quick. <laughs> That's a word we talk about a lot, and I'm not sure I have an operative definition for it. We need to think through these things. We need to think through them well. We need to think through them biblically. We need to understand what's going on. So we need to talk about the kingdom. This is a kingdom of God parable. Jesus began his public ministry announcing the kingdom of God, and the gospel writers summarize Jesus' ministry of word and deed in the phrase, the gospel of the kingdom. So we need to understand what is the kingdom. We've looked at the seed. Secondly, we're looking at the kingdom. In the beginning of Mark's gospel, John the Baptist comes, and he's preaching about the one who is to come and follow him. He is baptizing people for the forgiveness of their sins out in the Jordan River, But when people come to him and they talk to him and they honor him as a prophet or they question him because they're not sure what he's doing, all that he says is, you need to look for the one who's to come after me. I'm preparing the way. And like prophets do, John keeps preaching and he keeps challenging people and doing all the things that prophets do. And eventually he gets arrested. And after he gets arrested, Jesus then begins to follow after him. He begins Based upon what John has prepared the way for, he begins his public ministry. It says in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Let's read it one more time. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What we find when we study Mark's gospel is that 
The coming of the kingdom of God from chapter 1 right through to the end is a central theme of the whole of Mark's gospel. It begins with the coming of the kingdom. It ends with a discussion about the kingdom. And all the way in between, it is explaining what kingdom life looks like. So again, what is the kingdom of God? I'm going to give you definitions from four scholars. Because the Bible does not say in any chapter or verse, the kingdom of God may be defined as. We get things like parables. The kingdom of God may be defined as a mustard seed or maybe compared to a mustard seed, but we don't have a definition. So we, we need to figure this out looking at all of scripture. A guy named Graham Goldsworthy said, God's people got in God's place under God's rule. It's the first one. And we can maybe vote on this by you nodding your head or something. So, you know, not yet, not yet. There's still three more to come. It's nice to get kind of a well-orbed picture of this. So, so we look at Graham Goldsworthy, the kingdom is God's people in God's place under God's rule. Bruce Waltke says a nation consists of a common people sharing a common land, submissive to a common law, and having a common ruler. You're like, oh, I just saw somebody go like this. Mm, yes, very good. Scott McKnight, he says kingdom isn't just a state of affairs like justice and peace and love and holiness. Kingdom is a community made up of four features that shape the entire story of Israel. God, king, citizens, and land. The king is Jesus. The citizens are those who follow Jesus. And the land is the place where they will embody the kingdom of God. It's pretty good. The fourth one. The kingdom is the king's power over the king's people in the king's place. Kingdom is the king's power over the king's people in the king's place. I like that one. That's why I put it forth. I think it's helpful. It's very much like the first one, but it's clear. The kingdom is the king's power over the king's people in the king's place. And so when Jesus is preaching about the kingdom of God being at hand or the kingdom of God having come near, he's talking at least about the rule of a king or the power of a king who has authority over a people. And this really does set them apart as new citizens when they follow Jesus. They become his new people. And they gather around their new king as his new subjects. And these people then live out what they believe to be the announcement of the gospel wherever they go. They're living kingdom values wherever they go and whatever place they are in. It's the king's power in the king's people in the king's place. It speaks of the rule of the king over his new citizens wherever they are and wherever they go. There is no political boundary line drawn on a map that says this is where the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is wherever his people acknowledge his rule and his authority. That is where the kingdom of God is. Jesus is inviting people into his kingdom in a particular way. He is inviting them to repent of their sin. He is inviting them to turn from their previous way of being and to turn to him even as they then obediently reorient their whole lives around this new way of being that he is preaching and teaching and of which he is the center. So you can actually come into his kingdom. You don't need a passport. You need to repent and follow him. You don't need to go through any permanent residency changes and jump through a bunch of hoops and pay a bunch of fees to get new paperwork. You simply must lay down everything you are and reorient yourself around his kingship. And you can become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not being enacted through military force. You may have seen this in the history of the church. That is not the way of the kingdom. You do not enact the kingdom of God through military force. If that was the case, Jesus would have been looking for very large men with big swords. But that was not who he was going to. The kingdom of God is not like a conventional political campaign. There, there, there's no democratic vote. It's not like Jesus is coming into his kingdom and he starts to talk to people and he's got a little piece of paper and he goes, Hi, my name's Jesus. I'm from Nazareth. <clears throat> I'm the king. So I'm just, if you, if you would acknowledge that, if you could just fill this ballot out, really hoping to be, you know, seen by everybody as the king. Thank you very much. It's not a democratic election. Like when the new king of England was, what, are, what is it called when he's put in? Come on, you're British. The coronation. Thank you. I'm, he's also my king, which is what John would say to me. 
Um, we have spicy debates about nature of the Commonwealth, but my point being, my point being, when he came into power, did anybody ask if he was approved? If, if, did anybody say, like, are we okay with this? No, he's a king. When, when a new Roman Caesar took office as the new Caesar, they did not go around the Roman Empire making sure everybody was okay with it. There was an announcement that the king had come, and you're going to follow his law, or you're going to be steamrolled. <laughs> that was the empire. In a very different way, but in a perhaps more significant way, Jesus Christ is king. He's not looking for your approval. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He's being revealed as such in and through the gospel of Mark. The kingdom is not enacted through military force. It's not conventional political stuff that goes on. It's more like a mustard seed that is planted in the ground and grows and spreads in profound way. But talking about the kingdom of God, it was not limited to John the Baptist and Jesus. They weren't the only people talking about the coming of the kingdom of God. What was different about them was the way they talked about the kingdom of God. It was vastly different than anyone else. Let me show you. It says in verse 15 of Mark chapter 1, look at it again. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay, what made Jesus preaching of the kingdom, what made it different? Well, the new thing was not that he was preaching of the kingdom. Lots of people, again, they were doing that. It's that he spoke of the kingdom having arrived. It has come. That is very different than the message anybody else was preaching. He said, the time is fulfilled. All that you have been waiting for, all the promises of God, are coming to pass in this moment. You've been long awaiting the Savior King. He is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has come near. That is very different than the message anyone else was preaching. Jesus was not saying that he's you know, somehow connected to the kingdom of God and that the kingdom is like part of his message and teaching and his mission. He's saying that he believed the kingdom of God was now breaking into history in himself. Jesus is announcing that he is the kingdom. Do you see this? This was summed up by a theologian in the third century that's as good as anything I've ever heard. He, he said Jesus was not only, he, he called Jesus absolute wisdom and righteousness and truth. Absolute wisdom, absolute righteousness, absolute truth. And he called Jesus absolute kingdom. And what he meant by that is that Jesus is the very kingdom itself in person. You want to know what the kingdom of God is like? Look at Jesus. The kingdom arrives in the person and power of Jesus. It's Jesus' kingdom, Jesus' rule and reign, Jesus' authority over Jesus' people anywhere and everywhere that they are. The kingdom arrives in the person and power of Jesus, and we just need to see that there is more to it than that. that this now creates a particular kind of tension that we feel as followers of Jesus in the city of Vancouver in 2023. And the reason is, is that Jesus' kingdom arrived in his incarnation. The kingdom is now already, but the kingdom is also not yet. It's a small seed that goes into the ground. It is hidden, it is unassuming, it is overlooked. And that seed is going to grow into a plant that is larger than expected, and it's going to provide a shade for many to come under it. But, but the fullness of it has not yet been seen. Again, go to Mark chapter 4, verse 30. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or, with, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. I think this parable is shining some light on two aspects of Jesus' kingdom. These two aspects of the already and the not yet. Because on one hand, Jesus' kingdom has come in his incarnation and the beginning of his ministry. And that's what he he's announcing when he begins to proclaim the gospel of God, the good news of the kingdom. And he calls people to repent and to believe the good news. It is is like a seed sown in the ground. But on the other hand, there are promises of what the fullness of this kingdom will look like at the end of the age, and we still have not yet seen those promises fulfilled. 
But one day we will see the fullness of God's kingdom come. And the sheer scope of it will be greater than any of us could have possibly imagined. And again, that is the already and the not yet tension of the kingdom. We live here in the tension in between those places. We know things are not as they ought to be. We can see the sort of destruction all around us in the world. That Jesus is praised as king by his people, but he is ignored by everyone. But there will be a day when he comes. And when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Sin will be no more. Death will be no more. Pain will be no more. Crying will be no more. There are promises that we long for that we have not yet received. They are kingdom promises of the not yet. When Jesus began preaching and teaching, he preached the kingdom of God, and it was hidden, though, though it was hidden in some ways. People started to slowly realize that he was the king he was talking about. How do we know he's the king? We've looked at the seed, we've looked at the kingdom. We need to look at the cross. When Jesus was betrayed by his friend, he was turned over to the authorities. He was falsely tried, falsely condemned, and sentenced to death. It was then that we see the revelation of who he is. Let me show you, Mark chapter 15. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered them, you have said so. Verse 16, and the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and they twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. Verse 25, it was the third hour when they crucified him and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Of the Jews. See, when the Romans were putting someone to death by crucifixion, the inscription of the charges against them were nailed on the cross above their head. That everyone who walked by might know that's what he did. That's why he's being put put to death, the king of the Jews. See, Mark's gospel begins with Jesus talking about the kingdom, and it ends with Jesus revealed as the king. But he is a king who wears a crown of thorns who is enthroned not on a great high and lofty seat. He is enthroned on a cross. And it's only through his death that he comes to truly reign over all. Patrick Schreiner, he said, if the kingdom is the goal, then the cross is the means. But this does not mean that the cross simply falls between the ages. Rather, it is the wheel that shifts one age into another. It is the great transition piece, the turn of the ages for the people of God seeking their place. Do you see the already and the not yet? Something changes in the life and the teaching and the ministry of Jesus, but that shifts with his death upon the cross. It's not just what happens in the middle. It is the pivot that spins everything forward. Jesus becomes king through the cross. Our assurance of victory comes through apparent defeat. Our place in the kingdom comes through an atoning death where our sins are carried by our king on that cross, where the wrath of God for sin is satisfied in the death of the perfect and sinless one in our place. He is the one who makes a way for us to enter into true kingdom life. Verse 15 of Mark chapter 1, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. See, this is the way we enter in. We enter in cleansed by the blood of Christ. We turn away from our own small K kingdoms and we repent of our sin. That means we turn. We believe the truth of who Jesus was revealed to be. We, we turn to him and we trust in what he has done for us, knowing that we were never going to be able to do what he did. We have to receive what he did for us by faith. Then and only then can we enter into kingdom life. This is the subversive kingdom being revealed in the parable of the mustard seed. In this kingdom, true life comes through death. True strength is found in weakness. 
True joy must first come through sorrow. And until you come to a place where you recognize your sin before God and you were grieved by it, you can't enter. It's when you recognize that you've not lived the life that you should have lived and that you've done things you shouldn't have done. And you might consider yourself a pretty good person and on your street, you might be one of the best. That's not how it's measured. You're not measured in a comparative righteousness scheme against everybody else around you whereby you can always find somebody who's worse and point at them. You're measured by the holiness and perfection of God himself. And the Bible teaches us that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. All of us are in need of forgiveness. All of us can only get it by entering into the kingdom through repentance and faith, by believing the gospel and trusting in him. You can't earn it on your own. I know some of you would love the project in front of you of becoming the kind of person that God would love. You just have to understand that's not how it works. That's not how you enter into the kingdom. He already loves you. That's why you're invited. He loves you. That's why you're invited. You don't become so lovable that you then get to come and participate. He loves you. That's why he made a way for you to enter in. So you sit and wrestle all week with the things that you've done that you know you shouldn't have done and you're thinking, how do I atone for this sin? How do I get this off my chest? It's that weight that you feel where you know you're not good but you don't want anyone else to know because if someone else knew, then it'd be kind of scary. God knows, and he's okay with it. The only way you come to him is by admitting that you're a mess. You can't clean yourself up enough to belong. You belong because he loves you and invites you, and the only way in is through Jesus. Mark chapter 8, verse 34 says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. See, the kingdom of God is for all kinds of people, but there's only one way in. It's going to require a complete reordering of your life, a complete recentering of your life on Jesus. It's going to demand your whole heart, nothing less. If I told you otherwise, I'd be lying. It's not like you can you hear some of these people say, oh, just come to Jesus, everything will be better. Yes, ultimately, but maybe not temporally. You might face difficulties because you're aligned with Jesus, not the opposite. Everything doesn't get smooth when you go to Jesus. What, what happens is, is you now have a new ability to go through challenges. You now have new resource to persevere. You now have new resource at your disposal through through a new relationship with God who loves you. There's something completely transformative, but it's going to cost you everything. Why would you want in if it wasn't like that? It's going to cost you everything, but the price, the price is Jesus coming to him. He's paid it all. You come and align yourself with him. You follow him and you enter his kingdom. And for all of you who would follow Jesus and all all you who do follow Jesus and all those maybe of you who are working this out, let me encourage you with one more thing about the nature of the kingdom of God that we find revealed here in the parable of the mustard seed. Sometimes the brilliance of Jesus' parables, I think it's easy to miss if you don't set them back into the original context of where they were heard. There's something here that I think his disciples would have known about mustard plants that I'm guessing most of us don't. In the first century, right around the same time as Jesus, there was a Roman author called Pliny the Elder, and he published an encyclopedia of natural history. It was kind of like the prototypical encyclopedia that we then find later on. He published that in like 77, 78 AD. He lived around the same time as Jesus. This is what he said about a mustard seed. With its pungent taste and fiery effect, mustard is extremely beneficial for the health. It grows entirely wild, though it is improved by being transplanted. But on the other hand, 
When it has once been sown, it is scarcely possible to get the place free of it, as the seed, when it falls, germinates at once. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And when it grows, it becomes the largest plant in the garden. What the text doesn't say that I think would have been assumed by all of the hearers is that it spreads like mad. The kingdom of God. The people speaking with Jesus were more connected to the growth of their food than we are. So when Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed sown on the ground that becomes the biggest of the plants, they appreciate the unspoken part of what he has said. It is going to spread and you are going to have a hard time controlling it. This is the subversive nature of the kingdom and why Jesus is a threat to every ruler in the world. Jesus is a threat to every ruler of every kingdom that has ever been, including you who sit on the throne of your own life. I think he's saying something like this. The kingdom of God is like mustard seed, which is very small but is filled with disproportionate potential. I think he's saying something like the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed and if you plant it in the garden of your life, it will quickly grow to be bigger than anything else. I think he's saying the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed and when it grows, it will multiply and spread and when it spreads, it is going to come to be the dominant thought in the center of your life. See, earlier I said Jesus' message, the message of his kingdom, his kingdom is subversive. Jesus comes out of nowhere from little backwater town somewhere. (laughs) But his message is starting to take heart in the roots of people who have heard it. And just like a seed that is planted with the hope and the expectation of what it's going to grow into, Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God is all about the potential of what was to come. See, after his resurrection, Jesus dies on the cross, he's buried in the tomb, on the third day he is risen. After his resurrection and before Pentecost, he's got barely more than 100 followers. you got to picture this. He's got less people who follow him than are in this room. (laughs) But when the Holy Spirit comes upon the church on the day of Pentecost, and the believers are filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus' kingdom movement multiplied there in Jerusalem and then in Judea and then in Samaria and then throughout the Roman Empire and then to the ends of the earth to 2,000 years later where we're sitting here talking about a mustard seed in Israel. The message of the kingdom is that once it starts to spread, it's tough to control. The message of the kingdom means there is more, not just to life in general, but there is more for your life. It's a royal call to come to your king, to align with his rule and reign, to seek to live out his ways, and to join his kingdom work as the good news of the gospel of Jesus' kingdom spreads throughout the world in word and deed. It is a subversive kingdom, and you might find that it doesn't tear your life down, but actually sets your life right side up. Will you enter? Are you in? Will you spread? It's the nature of his kingdom that it goes from person to person to person. It's hard to control. It's why you find other nations around the world who make Jesus illegal. And you know the most beautiful thing that happens when they make Jesus and the preaching of Jesus and the Bible and Christianity and churches illegal in their countries is the church starts to spread because you can't root it out. Jesus' kingdom is going to advance until he returns. And when he comes, we'll have all the promises that we found in the text. And I'm sure more that we can't comprehend. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand and respond with me.